so all right, let's do it with the mouse. All right, so I'm here to give a talk on universal tools for acceleration, timing, integration, and machine enhancement. Um, who am I? I'm Hashem Williams, firmware engineer, open source contributor, uh, RISC V tech enthusiast, and uh, community member. So I think um, earlier Alistair asked if anybody in the room was. I think I was the only one to put my thumbs up. Um, my day job, I work on firmware, BIOS, UFE, and this is sort of a hobbyist thing I do outside of that. Um, based in Brisbane, and the last time we had a conference in Brisbane, this happened, uh, floods three, hap three days before the event. Um, people brought kayaks down and the venue changed. So I thought I'd bring a kayak down. Um, didn't quite fit in the car. And I uh, got involved with this basically because of Tim videos. Tim videos, well, Tim will be giving a talk after this, but he's involved with all the AV stuff for Linux, Conf, PyCon, etc. So why even go into the trouble of using an open ISA? Why not just go um, buy an off-the-shelf uh, processor like an ARM and Intel? Mainly because of the reason for acceleration. We're reaching a point where uh, we're reaching the end of Moore's law, essentially. So 40, 50 years ago, uh, we were down here, and we're up here. This is eventually going to plateau. Sooner or later, you won't have any more processing power on a single core. Uh, if we go back through the history of processors, uh, back in the 1980s, Intel CISC chips were used mainly everywhere, and there were a lot of patent licensing costs. Uh, moving forward to the 90s, um, we said uh, the number of transistors inside the CPU doubled every 12 to 18 months relative to the cost, and ARM um, started to become something. Uh, 2000s, we get some open source cores, open risk, open spark. Uh, this was around in the time when I was at uni and accelerators start to be um, needed. And then today, a lot of diverse computing needs, communications, IoT, AI, needs custom processor development. You're gonna be limited by the amount of power or something that uh, slows your processor down. Um, I mainly wrote this about RISC-V since they're the older open uh, ISA, but um, I do mention uh, open power a little bit on. And why does the instruction set even ma matter? Different uh, vendors sell different chips um, to different markets. So Intel sell, don't really sell mobile chips, they try to get in there. Um, they try to get into servers, they're not in there too much. And IBM sell mainframes. Uh, it's the most important part in any computer system, and it's where the software meets the hardware. Um, as I've said before, this is an article that came out, I think, over the weekend. Uh, 2020, we're starting to reach the point where computing hardware can't be expanded a lot more. And it's being, we are a bit complacent. Um, but open software standards work. Um, you guys might have heard of this thing, Linux. Uh, free open implementation of a POSIX OS. Likewise, pre implementations of GCC, L LVM, databases, uh, graphics. In terms of ISAs, there's not really a lot out there. There was Risk Drive, um, Open Power now. A lot of these other designs aren't fantastic, they have a lot of legacy. You can boot up an x86 processor with the same code from 1980 and, but that's 40 years old now. Um, probably older than half the people in this room. Anyway. Um, <laughs> RISC-V based instructions, there's a 32-bit, 64-bit, 128-bit implementation. Uh, the number of instructions that you need to run on a RISC-V system, uh, very little, and you do have a lot of registers. Uh, everything else is pretty much standard across that. Um, 
everybody's been mentioning RISC V extensions. I, I won't go repeating that all again, but essentially the main ones here um, that I want to mention briefly again, there's an extension for, for JITs, um, so just in time or dynamically translating languages, bit manipulation, good for communication systems, vectors, uh, if you want to do some DSP type stuff and the hypervisor stuff that they mentioned earlier this morning. So the greatest thing about an open ICA is you can do this stuff on the right. Um, up until open ICA was around, pretty much the two ways you would do something, you would have a CPU attached over a bus with some accelerator, maybe on a desktop this would be PCI, um, in an FPGA, Wishbone or uh, Axie. Uh, alternatively, this is the other way we would connect things. Um, ever since the 80s, it's always been done this way. CPU, math coprocessor, for example, buy an 8086 and get an 8087 math co, and so on. If you wanted to accelerate something um, and you write some newfangled extension, how are you going to get it supported? Um, create an extension add some code to GCC, add some tests for the extension, test the code, um, basically the last talk. Uh, Sci-5, they uh, created the Freedom Platform, which has been open sourced. Um, and again, this is just a copy of what they said at FOSDEM 2018. I think now it's starting to become a really mature environment. And you would find RISC-V used in the cloud, data center, mobile, wireless, automotive, consumer IT, memory, hard disks. Um, again, mentioning one of the sponsors, Western Digital, one billion cores, I think is, is your target. Um, and again, there's the environment of RISC-V, um, Western Digital here, and a lot of other big players and companies. Um, Samsung is interesting that they're using it inside uh, some of the modems to connect to 5G, a uh, whole heap of uh, universities and foundries and a lot of members inside the Risk Tribe Foundation. Um, as I was mentioning before, I'm a community member. Basically, fill out a form, you get these benefits. Um, so I tend to use RISC V in FPGAs. Uh, the main reason I got involved with the stuff with Tim videos. Bex RISC V is uh, RV32 IMCA, and again, all the extensions already mentioned before. Uh, you can run Linux, Zephyr, FreeRTOS, and it's written in Spinal HDL, um, which is again, I think, an open source uh, higher hardware description language. Uh, Microwipe has already been mentioned a lot today, but this is VHDL. I think this was just the example of compiling something, and I th think it's straight off their GitHub. Um, there it is booting up into MicroPython and spitting out some code. HDMI to USB, again, been mentioned a lot today, probably will be mentioned a lot in the next talk. I'm going to skip a couple of these slides and move on to the next sort of major topic. Timing. Uh, who in this room has sort of got any experience with digital hardware design? Okay, so we're more sort of software oriented uh, conference. I'm going to say basically the only open source option out there is Verilator. Um, go read a textbook on digital hardware design or go to one of the OR conf conferences. They're a lot more on hardware digital design. If you want to write something to speed up your algorithm, your streaming, your uh, calculations, in hardware is always going to be faster than in software. And moving on to integration. Uh, LightX, so I think Tim uh, Zobs has mentioned this a lot in his previous talk. So it's written in MyGen. You write your hardware description language in Python, not in Verilog, VHDL. 
You can do your state machines in Python. It allows you to create really complicated systems on chips. Um, some of the current soft cores are already supported. Uh, there's two RISC-V cores there, an open RISC core, something from Lattice Micro, a bunch of open source IPs, a lot of boards that it supports, and you can do simulation. You can pretty much target any FPGA on it. Um, some quick examples of how to do something in, in MyGen, uh, computational logic, uh, synchronous logic, and state machines. This is something that's a lot harder to do in uh, for Log VHDL. Being able to write your state machines in a simple manner can make things a lot easier. And I think uh, this has already been gone over a lot before, but you can do your debugging over bridges because writing hardware is hard. If you can inspect what's going on inside the FPGA, that makes your life a lot easier. Um, so an example here, this is probably stolen from one of Tim's sides. Uh, you have a peripheral attached to a bus, all the other things you need, um, running on inside the uh, F, talking, running inside on the FPGA, some control registers for RAM, flash, and ROM. But instead of having your soft core inside the FPGA, you can have your CPU on the desktop uh, interface to the stuff on the FPGA. So your synthesis times can be a lot quicker. Um, and again, simulation. LightX supports a bunch of CPUs, OpenRISC, VexRISC 5, Lattice Micro. I think you guys are working on getting some uh, Power9 in there, but it's... Uh, unfortunately, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, okay. I hadn't checked that, but yeah, didn't update my slides. And there's a bunch of cores there for interfacing to DRAM, SATA, Ethernet, SD card, and PCI, and USB. Uh, Sean, who was here previously, I don't think is in the room, helped get this up and running on FOMU. This is uh, early USB, for, um, so anything up to the full speed USB, 12 megabits per second. Uh, people started working on stuff for USB 2 and USB 3. We're not quite there with completely open source uh, IP. And the guys at Ant Micro um, run an open DMA controller that's pretty much portable across uh, various FPGAs. Uh, and again, something else from Tim's slides, uh, LightX build environment. This sort of makes using LightX a lot simpler. You've, it puts everything inside a Python environment, cross compilers, builds for your firmware, and programs your board. And LightX supports a bunch of different uh, FPGAs from your cheapest ICE40s, ECP5s, all the way up to your really expensive uh, ultrascale and Stratix. Um, there, there are a couple of other examples that people have been working on in the last couple of months. Um, talk to Tim and Sean Cross about FOMU, but essentially this is uh, probably the smallest uh, RISC-V development board out there. It's able to fit inside your USB port. It's got a USB soft core, which I mentioned before and for contact pads and an RGB LED. Uh, this workshop is really good. The guys ran it at uh, Chaos Computer uh, Congress recently and I had a lot of attendance. Other um, boards out there, uh, Icebreaker, connected to a Hub 75 LED display um, and of course Rick Rowling, everybody. The RD Dev Board, this was in, used in the Open FPGA Mini Conference in LCA 2018. Um, at that time, we was using Open Risk Processor, and I was involved in getting Linux up and running on that. 
Annie TV2, uh, another one of uh, Bunny and Zob's creations. Similar sort of task uh, where you want to intercept the HDMI stream and overlay something on the screen. And this is from some guys in Poland, um, a lattice micro um, that a uh, lattice FPGA that that uh, is available at a number of price points, and all of them would be Linux capable on a RISC V. And this is a cheap uh, dev board that's really hard to get in Australia, but um, quite a large size for what you pay for. I think it's is 100,000 gates from what I remember. And another tool that I'll just mention briefly, um, if you're working with hardware, uh, Glasgow um, should be soon on Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Um, very useful for debugging any sort of hardware interface. It's semi-written in something similar to MyGen. Uh, in terms of software, you would run on these systems, MicroPython, CircuitPython. Um, some common examples of uh, environment where you can write everything in Python and run it at, a, at an interactive prompt, much like you would do in the 80s on basic. And mention briefly Foopy. So Foopy is what runs on the FOMU. That's for the Python describing hardware running Python, MicroPython. Don't know where the name came from. Um, Tim can probably answer that. Bare Metal C on FPGAs, Zephyr, real-time operating system. And of course, you can run Linux. If you go to that GitHub, um, I think we've got it running on about 10 boards or maybe 20, somewhere in that sort of range. Uh, this was booting on the Arti from the uh, Open FPGA mini conference. If there's any kernel developers that want to help uh, with this, come see me, talk to me tomorrow at the kernel mini conf. Um, QMU been mentioned a lot here. Um, Alistair is, is the great, uh, the, the great uh, person to talk to when talking risk five on QMU. Uh, it's just an open source emulator for hardware virtualization. I'm not going to read out the whole slide there. Um, and again, somebody mentioned before, really long lines for QMU just to boot a Linux system. So that's uh, QMU running in Linux. And I think Renode's already been mentioned earlier today. Um, but again, very useful. QMU on steroids, essentially. You can also use it to debug the signals coming in and out of your FPGA, um, as well as signals traveling inside. Best to read that blog post if you want to know more about Renode. This is something I think the next speaker is talking about, SimbiFlow. Tim, is this essentially what you're talking about? Okay, but part of it. Um, anyway, machine enhancement. You want to accelerate your heart, uh, your design. So think of an x86 uh, being a, like a surfboard. I'm just going to throw this all around water, essentially, because we're on the Gold Coast with a uh, tourist destination, right? Um, um, dual power arms um, powered kayak, risk five power jet ski. This is sort of an in-joke from OAConf, and we don't really have a watercraft to describe power nine yet. So anyway, x86 surfboard, of course, run it with a penguin on top. Yeah, I, I think you can run that serverless, the penguin can surf on its own. <laughs> uh, a dual arm powered kayak. This is my son kayaking behind the convention center yesterday. And the risk by powered jet ski. So if anybody went to our conf, the directions for one of the restaurants was to take an open hardware jet ski, which I managed to get one yesterday. They're freely available. So 
I don't know how Rescribe managed to do that. Um, so the future. My slides have gone funny. Anyway, I've missed the thing. Uh, Python, it's getting everywhere. Some of it's being decorated, uh, deprecated, but it's still going on. But the snakes are everywhere. Python here, Python there, Python everywhere. Hal, sounds missionally like IBM. AI, that's getting used everywhere. And we're getting to that stage, hopefully not anytime soon. Plenty of people getting towards working on uh, general AI and maybe using openizers. And I think Carl was one of our AV guys, but I don't think that's him. Anyway, back to the topic. I've got 10 minutes left, so. We don't have anything for uh, open power, but I managed to score this earlier. Sorry, I'll just disappear high behind. Just imagine um, 30 years from now, what, what's happening in open ISA? We're gonna go into the future. Um, what's the, the Y2K38 bug has happened, right? What's happened to all the ISAs out there in the world? Of course, you're going into the future. You've got to have the right tie for your... Uh, Sorry, this, this should be a lot quicker, but anyway. Okay, all right, we're in the future now, right? 2050, 30 years from now. Why 30 years? I don't know, it's an arbitrary thing. Maybe, maybe people from, the, from movies 30 years ago would know what I'm talking about. Anyway, we should have gone to that slide. Power, open power. Open power, well, this, this is the perfect device to describe open power. I uh, don't know what that's for, we'll just throw that away. Hoverboard. Um, I'm not sure if this is gonna work. I don't think I've charged it up, but, okay, right, let's see if we can get a hoverboard. There we are, hoverboard, <laughs> right? Those boards don't work on water unless you've got power. So if you guys can give me a power ionizer, we can uh, get this working on water. Um, and since we're in the future, let's go to the holoverse. This literally is in the Gold Coast, uh, the dinosaur world. So over here on the left, um, there's an X86osaurus and an Armosaurus. <sighs> What's the future of our open ISA? Power 19, this time the ISA is really, really personal. And risk 15, the quest for more CPU instructions. Um, there's some people from Sci Fi in the room. Uh, I think this guy's name is David Hewlett, their previous speaker. <laughs> I think HP's been mentioned. But uh, yeah, we were talking about holograms, and David Hewlett's for, famous for doing uh, this hologram. Really funny thing you probably should watch on YouTube. But anyway, the future is whatever you make it, so make it a good one. Any questions? Because I'm running out of time. <laughs>